We're back row Baptist today, aren't we? <laughs> All right, welcome. This is a presentation on the Visit Love Letters. These are some love letters I found in England, and I have found it to be the most fascinating story of several research projects going on in England. And this is the most historically significant. It's also the most complicated. It's very, we're just going to get kind of an introduction to it today. It's an epic story, and I often call it Pride and Prejudice in Reverse, because it's written at the same time Jane Austen is writing. It's a true love story, um, but the woman has the fortune. And so, um, the Visit Love Letters, I also have a YouTube channel. We are videoing today, and we'll be putting it up on that YouTube channel. Some of my other research projects are up there too. It's called Adventures in British History. John Rice is helping with the computer day, and I sure appreciate that. Um, the next slide shows you where these letters were found. This is England, you can see London over on the right, and it was found in the Cotswolds, which is the most beautiful area of England, in my opinion. Lots of movies are filmed there. A lot of thatched cottages. And it's kind of like the Hill District here in Texas. It doesn't have exact boundaries. It's just a general area. It's called an area of outstanding natural beauty, where they preserve everything, and you can't change anything in the village that I found them. And um, these are the little roads you have to drive a couple miles down little bitty one-lane roads to get to this village. And there's just a couple of the people that live there. And there is a massive manor house there, kind of like a Downton Abbey. It's called Sherborne House. It's 60,000 square feet. It was owned by Lord Sherborne's for 500 years. And before the Reformation, it was owned by Winchcombe Abbey, but it probably didn't look much like that. Parts of the house are medieval for, um, before the Reformation. And um, the church, as you can see, is about a foot away from the house. And um, the tower there is 14th century. The house's age is a very tricky thing because it's, it's different parts of it are different ages. But um, it would have been the front would have been redone in the 1830s. But it looks very much like the house did before that. Um, the whole village is built up around this. The, everyone who lived in the village would have been employed by Lord Sherborne. And at his height, he owned about 40,000 acres. The last Lord Sherborne to own this estate died in 1982, and many people in the village worked for him. And they have um, cottages that have good rents that he guaranteed them in his will. Most of those are now widows. The men that worked on the estate, most of them are gone. But um, I found, here it is, it's a, a cottage in Sherborne, Gloucestershire. Now, there's a big town in England called Sherborne, and this is definitely not it. Okay, this is this is not a town or a city by any stretch of the imagination. Only a few hundred people live there. This cottage, for instance, would have been built in the 1830s. And uh, so I live in this village three months a year and love it, and have become obsessed with the history there. And somebody told me when they found out I was a British historian, oh, you must, you must go down to this cottage. They're kind of like the local historians. They've got a lot of documents. So I called, because we had a mutual friend, and I asked if I could have an appointment to come see their documents. And they were a little skeptical of me, check me out on the website. That's when I was an associate professor of history at Houston Baptist University teaching European history. And they decided, okay, maybe I, I was okay. So I had a two hour appointment, and um, I went in and I stayed a month and a half. It was a much longer than a two-month appointment. There were so many wonderful documents there. I thought, my gosh, I could spend the rest of my career looking at their documents. And the people who own the cottage, or who take the cottage from uh, Lord Sherborne, are Jenny and Eddie Jewell. He is now deceased. Um, but uh, Jenny, Jennifer, is very, very much uh, still alive. And it really belonged, uh, some of these documents belonged to their grandson, uh, Byron. And uh, Byron Hadley is his name. Most people think his last name is Jewel, though, because it's very, very close with his grandparents. And uh, um, where there's a whole bunch of documents. I had a little bitty digital camera. I was completely unprepared what I was going to find. If I had to do it over again, I would have run to a big city and bought really expensive photography equipment. I was a little nervous that I would out, you know, not my welcome, wear out my welcome. So I was trying to just be there a few hours a day. And, uh, go back to my place and flip the 
the uh, photographs and put them in files and organize them. But I was there a month and a half. And these particular letters stood out to me immediately. And um, I didn't have time to read them, but I did know they were love letters when I brought them home. Just had digital photographs of them. And I brought those uh, letters home. And there I am uh, that Christmas. I would go back and uh, work on these letters again, do some re-photographing, and uh, realize that you can um, hold them up to the water, hold them up to natural light, or a, I didn't have natural light at Christmas time, so I had a lamp, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's watermarks in there. It'll tell you the year that the letter uh, stationery was produced, which is usually the year it's actually written on. Mm -hmm. And so these letters were fascinating, and I started giving them to my students, and we started transcribing them, and the unusual thing about finding letters in a cold situation like this, meaning cold, like this is not a proper archive, this is somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really realize what they were. They certainly had tons of them, but they didn't really know what they were. And it just took, it took me months just to figure out, why are they in my village? Like, my village is in Gloucestershire, and all these events take place in Wiltshire, the next county. And who the people were, I mean, I'd never heard their names, but if you go to a proper archive, they'll give you a little summary of it, right? So you have some context, but everything had to be filled out. I'm called the first courtship starts in 1802. Um, we know that because uh, the man who writes the love letters writes about when they met. He doesn't write about it until 1811. He says, in 1802, a day I shall never forget. Mm -hmm. And the letter, sometimes to save postage, you write crossways. So imagine being one of my students and you get assigned one of these letters to transcribe. You're like, curse in my name. Like, I can't believe I'm doing this. is very difficult to do, uh, to watch it go crossways. Um, but that saves you postage. And here's some of the watermarks. You can see if you hold it up, particularly to a lamp, you can see the, the stationer and the year they made it. And um, People bought the stationery quite a bit, and you usually wrote on it right away. It's an expensive thing. You don't put it in your drawer like you and I do maybe for 10 years. <laughs> and so the watermarks were interesting. And then um, I found those letters. There's about 110 of them. I found those several years ago. Uh, then I've been doing administrative work at Houston Baptist in here, and so I didn't really look extensively at them. I did a lot of work on them and then put them aside for several years. And then two summers ago, I found another one of the Bissett Love Letters two doors down. And what they both had in common is that they were, the women were both uh, widows of men who worked for Lord Sherborne. And when Lord Sherborne died in 1982, that big house that you saw, the big manor house, it was sold to a private investor. And he wanted to convert it into uh, individual condos, flats is what they called them. And uh, so the, the, the men who worked for Lord Sherborne were ordered, because the estate still goes on, okay, um, it still has administration, they said to those men, go and empty out the entire attics of this 60,000 square foot house. And so both of these men were given that task and they felt very uncomfortable about it because they were throwing things away. They were supposed to throw them away in the skip, which is what we would, you know, put a big dumpster, but uh, Brits call it a skip. And they felt uncomfortable about throwing some things away, so they just brought them home. And they sat in the home for 30 years until I showed up. And here's this Texan, you know, who's obsessed with British history, and I'm getting very interested in their local history. And they were kind enough to show these to me. But uh, Margaret Shaw, who is our um, secretary for the parish uh, council for our church uh, structure, um, I was there to talk to her about uh, some church things and some history things because she knew the last Lord Sherborne. And I was asking her about the death certificate and stuff because she knew him pretty well. And then when I was walking out, she said, Diane, I think I might have some letters you'd be interested in. Mm -hmm. And they're about this high, and she gave them to me, and the top one was a visit love letter. And I mean, I almost cried, I barely knew the book, but I was like, oh my gosh, it's a visit love letter. I never thought about one of them being missing. And it's the very best of all. It's very long. Been footnoting that recently, and there's 75 footnotes for this uh, particular letter. But it brings several of my research projects together, and um, it's not only to his wife, but it also is um, brings some of the other major research projects I have. They're all of his wedding together. But this is what the envelopes would look like. You can see there's no stamps yet. 
And uh, a lot of times this is hand-delivered because she is the daughter of an earl. And you can see here it's Lady Catherine Howard is the woman he is enthralled with. That is the same name as one of the Henry VIII's wives that loses her head, but that's several centuries back. <laughs> and uh, you can see she lives in a little village called Charlton in the county of Wiltshire, which is very close to the larger town of Malmesbury. And so let me tell you a little bit about him. This is that manor house, and it was Lord Sherborne's seat. The Duttons are the name of the family. And what does this have to do with this guy? No, no, no. What? I, it took me a while, it took me three months to figure out, because I was very novice to it all, what are they doing in Gloucestershire? All these events, these people live in Wiltshire. But you can see the stables up there, right by the steeple. Those are the horse stables for people horses. Now they've been converted into beautiful flats. And there's another stables across the river that was for work horses. But it was a massive, massive estate. And, uh, so it's the center of a lot of big events, and there's some beautiful monuments in the church as well for the Dutton family. Now, if we go over to Wiltshire, the guy who's writing the love letters is named George Bissett, and he is the vicar of Malmesbury Abbey. Well, it keeps the name Abbey because it used to be, before the Reformation, a proper abbey with monks and all of that. And it is, as you can tell, mostly in ruins, beautiful ruins, but there is a significant part of this church that is not in ruins. And it is in good enough shape that they have their parish church there, and it's still there today. So it's kind of a prestigious position to have this. And um, there's a the little market square here. And anyway, this is the parish church part. And that, he's the vicar there. And um, that is not very far from where Lady Catherine lives. Lady Catherine uh, lives just about four miles away. Now, I've been working on this project for years and years, and I did decide that we were never going to find an image of George. He is low in the social spectrum, and you have to be pretty high in the social spectrum to have a portrait painted of you. And there's never been any record that it ever existed. So, I have been to Malmesbury Abbey several times, and looking for different graves, or trying to see if they have any documents or whatever. So um, last, not this summer, but the summer before, I had my research assistant with me, and I wanted her to see the Abbey. Um, so brought her there, we looked around, we talked to the guy who had visitors and uh, greeted visitors at the desk and things. And then we're leaving, and um, I said, uh, oh, I think one of us had to, uh, Billy had to go to the loo. She had to go to the bathroom. So we, she goes to the bathroom and go down this little hall, and I'm kind of waiting outside the bathroom. I'm kind of bored, you know. Oh, she hurry. And, and it's a little narrow hall, and there's this water painting there. And I realize it's the interior of the abbey. And then at the bottom of it, it says this. I've never been down that hall to the loo. It says the interior of the abbey, dated 1810. I said, well, Billy! Hurry up! I think we have an image of George! Because George is the vicar there from the late 18th century until his death in 1828. So the odds of this being him, well, it's not the most detailed image ever, but it's the only one I'm going to get. And so when you see, I'll show you a zoomed in picture. He's up there. And the interior doesn't look like this anymore, but it's a beautiful image. And that's our only image of him. But he is the vicar close by to, you see those box. Uh, pews, mm -hmm. yeah. Little families would have the box pews, mm -hmm. and you could, I, I, we did a little video. See the little children; they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Like there's lots going on in the in the image. Um, so I like that. But anyway, so these are the people that fall in love. This is a miniature of Lady Catherine Howard, done in 1803, and she's considered one of the great beauties of her day. She is, this image is published in a French magazine that's very popular at the time, of, uh, showing the beauties of England, and she's an aristocratic lady. She is the only daughter of the Earl of Suffolk. And uh, the, the vicar, which is about four miles away at Malmesbury Abbey, is Reverend George Bissett, and that's the close-up of it, and they have fallen in love. Um, one other thing that I thought was interesting uh, the first king of England, Athelstan, 
is buried at Malmesbury Abbey, and when George is vicar there, they decide to open his tomb, and George, I'm like, George is going to get to see his face? Well, there's nothing there inside the tomb when, he, when they open it. It's just, they've lost the body, but they have built a beautiful tomb for Athelstan there. So how far away is it? Here's a Google map. Here's Malmesbury Abbey, and it's about four miles over to Charlton. And Charlton is where the seats of the Earl of Suffolk are. It has been since early, early 17th century. And it was very legal to walk in the park at Charlton, park being a much larger uh, acreage than you and I consider a park. So if you've seen Pride and Prejudice, okay, they go and show up at Pemberley, and they might get a tour of the house. George isn't looking for a tour of the house. He just walks the land around it. That would have been common. So George is out there walking and runs into her in 1802. And um, walking would have been something George did a lot. He doesn't have very much money. He doesn't ride in a carriage or anything like that. This is an old tiny map. And uh, you can see Malmesbury. See how big Charlton Park is? That's the seat of the Earl of Suffolk. Okay, so he would have gone over there. And now I'm going to show you this aerial video of the house. This is Charlton Park. It doesn't have any sound, but this is drone footage. <laughs> it still stands. It was built in 1607, and it is owned by the Earl of Suffolk. And most of the letters in the courtship are delivered by hand to this house. And um, it was in October of 1802. We know the exact date because he wrote it in a letter, thank goodness. Yeah. And so it's a massive, massive estate, even today. It's unlike Lord Sherborne's estate. Lord Sherborne's estate has gone to the National Trust. And then the house went into private hands. But this did not. This, that, uh, that estate is still owned by the Earl of Suffolk. And let me tell you a little bit about her, her family. You can see she had quite a few uh, siblings. But by the time they fall in love, there's only two of them left. And this is going to be her second brother, Thomas, and herself. Her parents, the Earl and Countess of Suffolk. Most notably is that they had an older brother that was the heir to the earldom, has made the most fabulous marriage ever, married one of the great heiresses in the kingdom, and is tragically killed in a hunting accident which causes the family enormous trauma. So this is an old drawing at the time the romance uh, was occurring. And then this is a little fade into what it looks like today. Um, let's look at the interior. It's very well known for the WOMAD festivals, like a Woodstock type of thing. Oh, yeah, once, a year, wow. once a year, they go out there and camp, and uh, lots of different bands play. And it's terrible uh, traffic around there. Yeah, very, very difficult traffic, but anyway, um, that happens once a year, helps that estate uh, raise money. And the interior of it, this is the Great Hall. And the Great Hall would have had this structure, but it wasn't completely finished when she lived there. Um, this is the current Earl's brother, is uh, Maurice George, Maurice George, Maurice Howard, the Honorable, uh, the Right Honorable Maurice Howard. His father was the Earl, and now his uh, brother is the Earl. Suffolk and Berkshire, it's a dual earldom, and they lost their father in the war. He was a bomb uh, detonator during the Blitz, and I think something like the 37th bomb blew him up. Mm -hmm. And so I believe uh, Morris or Maurice was about four years old, and his older brother was five, so he's been earl forever. And they're still earl. Can you let me in? Now they have broken this house up also into private apartments, like uh, Sherborne House, and this is somebody's living room. But they have these on leases, like long leases, not um, ownership in and of itself. But uh, there's two of them for sale now if you'd like to buy one at one <laughs> lease. Now you can see here, these are the counties of England. London is here at Middlesex, okay? And I found these in Gloucestershire. The events occurred in Wiltshire, and I am convinced that word of this romance got to Hampshire. That's the abbreviation for Hampshire. 
And um, it's fascinating because there's so many landowners that own land in Wiltshire and Hampshire, you know, they just border one another. And many of these people knew the Bissets or the Earl of Suffolk and also knew Jane Austen's family. The, I um, have right now over 50 files of connections, social connections that are one degree separated from Jane Austen. And it's just amazing. I, very interested in that for this. So it found in Gloucestershire occurred, these events occurred in Wiltshire, and I certainly have reason to believe Jane Austen knew about it. Um, okay, so Jane Austen is alive during this period, she's writing during this period, and that is something that helps transcribe them if you know the verbiage of her novels. A lot of times that'll help. I'm gonna skip this, oh no, no, I'm not gonna skip this. This is George's family tree. So George has a father that is Scottish, but he spends his whole career as a clergyman in the Church of Ireland in Ireland. And I think George is born in Ireland. And his mother is an heiress with an estate on the Isle of Wight, which is that big island really close to the shores, mainland England. And then they have these children. Now, some of them aren't very important for our story. The eldest brother is named Maurice or Morris George, that's his middle name, George, that's the problem. And then George, this is our guy who write, wrote the letters. And then the youngest child is Sophia, and that's George's dearest sibling, who he's closest to. And all these are very important to the story. Now this is the contemporary, only contemporary image we have of Maurice George, and it's a cartoon. But there's been a movie made about, a TV movie made about Maurice George, and he looks much more handsome. You click what? Oh, oh, sorry, I'll tell you that. One, one more click. Oh, I hope he comes up. There he is. Look, in the TV oh, no. <laughs> he's looking a lot better, don't you think? <laughs> this other, there's, I'm sorry, there's one other person that's quite important. Um, the second eldest brother is named William, and he's a clergyman in Ireland, too. His whole, uh, almost his whole ecclesiastical career is in uh, Ireland, and he will get very high up in the Irish church, as you will hear. Okay, now, there are, in these love letters, they're heart-wrenching, and you feel kind of awkward reading them, you know, 200 years after they were written in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. and you feel like we're kind of intruding, you know, the, Houston didn't exist, there wasn't one building, there wasn't anything when they were projecting him and working on him in class. But, it's very much like Pride and Prejudice. I mean, it's predictable. The novels of the day, not only Jane Austen, but other writers of the day have a real standard plot, don't they? And that there are, is a disparity in their fortunes. And there's definitely a disparity in their fortunes, okay? And then there's a huge gap in their social status. I mean, her father is a member of the House of Lords. Her father is a peer. Her brother will be a peer. And there is an enormous age gap, as you saw. There's a pretty big age gap, over 10 years age gap between them. Surprisingly, they are one of the poorest aristocrats in England. And she's not going to inherit very much. And I'll explain why that is in a second. The other thing that they do discuss, she brings it up a lot in these letters of why she won't marry him, is of her condition. And psychology as a discipline did not exist then, but she suffers from debilitating anxiety. So she's not a stock character of these heroines in the novels where she's all very confident and knows herself and is bold and that kind of thing. She is suffering terribly from anxiety and there's been a lot of trauma in her life, some of which I don't know what it is, but we know for sure that this death of their brother in 1800 was devastating to the family. The Earl, her father, broke down on the floor of the House of Lords in a speech about it. And it caused terrible ramifications, emotionally and financially, because they owed his wife a, an enormous uh, marriage jointure. Like she got a lot because she was a widow. Wonderful woman, but um, she didn't have a child with him yet. And so it has very similarities to Pride and Prejudice, except she's not Lizzie Bennet. She's beautiful, she's aristocratic, but she doesn't leave home very much. 
Now, here's some of the letters. They're just wonderful. George writing to Catherine. When I first suffered myself to be led away by the irresistible sweetness, you were not indeed of that very early age at which the world condemns a man for trying to engage the affections of a person to whom he is, in a worldly sense, unequal. So he's saying, I'm so much older, people are suspicious of me, mm -hmm. and also our ranks are so different in society. Remember, this is a society where you're born into a certain station, you're expected to die in that station. Some more of these letters. You were nevertheless so young, and I was so much older, that I felt many a pain and struggle before I could yield to indulge my unfortunate passion. What many told me would end in sorrow and disappointment. When a young lady of your rank receives the addresses of a man who is supposed to be unworthy of her hand, her relations with well-meant zeal unite to persuade her how miserable she will be if she pretends to judge of what is most conducive to her own happiness. So there's a lot of familial pressure to make a better marriage than this. The circumstances of her lover are dwelt upon to the exclusion of any little merit he may possess, and exactly the reverse is practice of the judgment formed about a suitor of a different sort, where every meritorious quality is too apt to be inferred from a superiority of rank and fortune. There's going to be a lot of other suitors. I don't know their names, though. I haven't been able to find who they are. But she's the only daughter of the Earl of Suffolk. And so a lot of people would like to, you know, aristocrats, like to join their houses, their family's fortunes with a peer of the realm, with that title. Um, so, if you think about Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy is very hesitant to remember how rude he is when he first proposes. This is not unlike her situation. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? To congratulate myself on the hope of relations whose condition in life is so decidedly beneath my own? And so you'll see in the peerage books, for instance, there's a lot of um, you know, the family and everybody in the family, who they married, their rank, rank of the person they married. And so this is a very important alliance, who your family marries into. You're going to be joining that extended family. may give them a lot of patronage, for instance. Now, the Countess gets in on some of this, too. A lot of these letters, she says, is it okay if I show my mother this letter? I tried not to tell her that I got a letter from you, but she could tell I was upset, so I showed it to her. And so occasionally, the Countess writes, and she just starts doesn't say, dear Mr. Bissett or Reverend Bissett, nothing. She just starts, and she doesn't sign it either. But a summary of one of the letters, she says, the Earl can never give his full and free consent to a union which he foresees from a confined income must be inevitably attended by distressing privations. And so she, she's kind of, she's a little bit wicked, I think, sometimes. She does not want this uh, marriage to occur. And I also think, she wants her daughter to stay home and stay with her because she's going to be all alone in this world um, and she doesn't want to, her daughter to go. George says, my only object in life has been to obtain an income that might enable me to hope for such a blessing as a union with you without entangling you in embarrassment and distress. This courtship doesn't go on for a year or two years. It goes on for 17 plus years. This back and forth and back and forth is just heart-wrenching. And he is so, it seems to me when I was reading the first one, he's so presumptuous. How does he know she loves him that much, right? He just won't give up. He will not give up. But later I figure out maybe he was right. <laughs> I did suppose that you had neither forgot me nor was quite happy in that absence. I did also suppose that if you could overlook the great disparity of our situations, Time and circumstances have now produced such a change that I might aspire to possess you without subjecting you to the resentment of your family. He's been really trying to make his status higher. And his particular status doesn't go up, really. His income goes up probably more than doubles by the time um, 1820 comes around, but his family status has improved. 